Annika. Hi, Pierre, and welcome, everybody. I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Pierre de Villers. For the context of working balanced and successful experience across the globe, Pierre has operated successfully in a variety of complex industry environments and cultural settings. An active critical thinker who's always looking to improve and add value to business and customers, Pierre has spoken at many industry events across Europe, including global contractor forums for both GE investors, as well as being featured in the Quality World publications, both as a committee member and as an industry expert. Please welcome Pierre to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Nicola, for that uh, introduction. And what I will say is I really appreciate um, your patience for the last few minutes. Um, the best laid plans around technology and just which is which is keeping us on our toes um, so as, as Nicholas said uh, in my past roles um, I have spent quite a lot of time both in um, insight and oversight roles when it comes to um, wind energy construction both offshore and onshore um, and experienced some real real interesting opportunities around learning and improving especially when it comes to cult cultural settings uh, and working in remote environments so what I'm going to do is um, share my presentation on the screen and then talk you through the slide pack um, in terms of some of my perceptions around um, the industry itself uh, and some of those um, pre-existing ideas that we have in terms of remote working, especially in, in the construction industry and onshore wind. So as I said, uh, the, the construction industry, especially when it comes to remote working, um, has got some great opportunities uh, and, and there's been some some interesting learnings across from the west side of our globe as we've gone through the renewables uh, and yes we've done a lot of wind work in, in Australia in particular around um, onshore wind uh, and and we do have a lot of our um, interesting opportunities locally around our, our cultures and remote working um, and there's only so much we can take from from other other sides of the world in terms of learnings and um, so from my perspective managing risk in, in remote work is all about people um, and it's all about having a resilient and competent team that trust each other and know each other and, and know what to expect and um, hence the reason I've got the quote there at the bottom uh, from Richie McCaw someone said to me the other day we're not sure who that is and that's fine uh, I'm a rugby person um, I do watch AFL and soccer and other things but I'm a rugby person and meeting uh, Richie McCaw a couple of weeks ago um, and my one question was um, what in terms of being probably the best all-black captain um, for many many years what is the what is the key to success in terms of in terms of keeping a team together working together keeping each other safe and looking after each other and having read the book legacy quite a few times um ar around the, the skills there of the team and he simply said it's about it's about it's about our team believing in something greater than than ourselves as individuals um and, and greater than the team uh, and and for them it was about the jersey uh, um and then the legacy that they leave uh, post post uh, post their time in the jersey for me in terms of the industry and for a lot of our, our team members both frontline and in in the support function um, when it comes to risk and people it, it, it's about looking after our people our environment and um, and ensuring that we have a sustainable culture in, in terms of delivering our projects um, and sustainable culture doesn't just mean not having injuries uh, and James and I have talked a lot about this it also means um, having um, downtime in terms of damage in terms of failures in terms of process breakdown all outside of things that we can't control, such as the weather. Um, and the less of those things we have, the less pressure we have on people, uh, and then the less confusion we have around decision-making. So for me, in terms of the vision, managing risk in, in remote locations, it's to make sure that increasing risk profile, uh, and what I mean by increasing risk profile, I'm talking about the increasing workload and the incoming uh, projects that we're seeing. We're seeing some big, big projects uh, coming through now in terms of onshore wind. Um, making sure that we identify the risks around the industry, uh, especially around our people, because um, that's where our value is. It's, it's all in our people uh, and make sure we mitigate those risks in proportion to what they present for, the, for our company and our, in our industry. And in turn, we want to make sure that any learnings that happen across our, our industry in Australia in particular are shared uh, and turned into value. I've always been a great believer that if something happens in terms of a undesired event or a, or a breakdown of a process or an, or an injury, we deal with it um, right then and there yeah, on, on the ground and, and the business learns from it, but we share the learnings and we try and get the best value out of it that we can. Um, because if we just see negative um, process breakdowns in our, in our business and our industry uh, as that, as negative, 
um, that we're never going to mature and progress um, and, and, and authentically be sustainable out, outside of those events. So for me in particular, um, I, I have a mission in terms of my role. I've spoken to James about this and, and a few others on the call. Um, it's about sharing that knowledge openly and freely uh, and making sure that we can we can all benefit. And, and there are industry bodies out there that, that are very happy to share knowledge openly and freely, especially around renewables. Um, and that's I think that's part of the that's part of the real key um, for us to improve is, is to share knowledge because knowledge is very important for us, uh, especially for those um, people who are fresh to the industry and, and potentially haven't worked away from home in the, in the, in the past, which is a big piece um, that we need to deal with. OK, I'll move to the next slide. OK, um, in terms of preconceived bias, I don't like now I don't like that word having put it there, um, but it does exist and, and, and we talk about it a lot. It's it's in a nutshell for me. It's what do we think we're going to expect? What what do we know we're going to expect? And from experience, where have we set um, our goals for success around bringing people into our business, into our teams, um, and making sure that we know what we can depend on in terms of people's roles. And going back to sport, I, I always go back to sport in terms of teams um, because I think it's it's a great example of uh, knowing what to expect from your teammates. Uh, and in particular, if you're on a, on a wind farm, I remember being down in South America um, and there was big language barriers there in terms of the people working because a lot of them came from Europe or, or from um, or from North America who didn't have a local language. And they communicated more so in pictorial form when we're looking at documents and procedures, but they all knew their roles and they knew what to expect from each other. So inadvertently, they created a really good culture locally without having great communication. And um, a lot of us would, would think that's a big concern, uh, especially in an emergency, not to be able to have that. But um, in, in working areas where there was literally no choice in terms of uh, the team members on the ground, um, you have to rely on, on that piece around the culture. Uh, so for me, precon preconceived ideas uh, around people in terms of competence and experience are probably some of the most challenging ones that we see all the time. Um, so for example, if we have um, a really, really tight um, time frame in terms of a project or in terms of getting some roles filled especially right now as we all know the industry is um, is being challenged around retention recruitment um, and 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 just basic filling filling our roles um, our, our level of risk appetite when it comes to experience really really shoots up through the roof so for example that person has done that job before um, or we've heard they've done that job before, so we can just put them in the role uh, and see how they go. Now, potentially for lower risk roles, um, we could we could manage that in terms of buddying people up and, and making sure that there are other processes in place to reduce the risk. But for things like um, technicians that need to go up turbines, um, who are installing blades, who are working 100, and 100 plus meters up in the air, that really doesn't, um, that doesn't allow for us to, to manage our risk. Uh, and then when you have a group of people with with with, with low experience, um, you really increase that risk. Um, but what we can do is reduce it by having really good set experienced people in place um, who can buddy up and coach with those people. But that's a pre-existing bias is, is that um, someone's done a little bit of something and then they can go on and, and crack on in these high risk projects. And again, we've seen that in quite a few different areas, um, even even here in Australia. I'm sure James can share a story. Um, where we've seen things like this um, locally in, in terms of competence. Um, the next piece in terms of going down the line with pressure. So as you can probably appreciate, there's a lot of pressure that comes on, on the contracting companies just po pre, um, pre mobilization of these projects. And it's a lot of it is around manpower um, and, and, and making sure that we have the roles in place for what we need. Now, sometimes that changes. Uh, we've just recently, what I've seen here, um, where I am now, um, a, a mobilization for a project has jumped forward two weeks. Now, that might not seem much um, for some people, but for those on, on, on them where we have planned and scheduled um, transport installation, um, elect electrical specialists, regulator visits, all these type of things, never mind mobilizing our teams, two weeks is at a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a point of an, an, an emergency for a company if, if a client pushes them out forward two weeks. Um, so needing them now doesn't mean that we have to circumvent and, and um, navigate around some of our key processes and steps of onboarding in particular. Um, and, I, and we do see that a lot where people go straight from uh, potentially working in, in very different environments, um, working as an electrician in a, in a service station or um, for a small contractor, and all of a sudden they're on site um, doing electrical work on 
on much much higher risk higher risk pieces of equipment and that's where we have to get make sure we do our due diligence as a business um that next one um is 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 very very common uh, my background after the military was rope access so i went from the military into rope access and i went all over the world um trying to enjoy the role and see as much as i can um and the challenge with rope access and in particular non-destructive testing was it was a it was a ticket collecting um role as well so when you get your rope access tickets with the rata that's that's um very well founded in its training and competence but when it comes to your non-destructive testing there's very different standards and, and collecting collecting those certificates and then doing the roles and there'll be a lot of that in obviously in in our wind industry as well um but having a license having a certificate um doesn't always as we know and i don't want to throw these out out of the out of the door doesn't always ensure that we are are competent and this morning um i was reminded of that very quickly um red p plates green p plates on vehicles and motorbikes uh, and yes i've got a license but please be aware i'm still fairly high risk on the road uh, and we almost <laughs> we've almost got to work at like that in the industry as well yes um i've got a rope access ticket or yes i've got an electrical license um or, or or yes i can do switching and all these type of things um but i'm fresh on site i'm uh, only new to industry so here's my red p plate um now that might be a bit embarrassing to people that's why we have the different color hats and everything else and and, and, the, and the levels of roles on site but um we tend to fall in the trap where someone is competent, the client is happy, uh, and and then off we go, um, and not really fulfilling that that experience gap around actually doing the role rather than having a ticket. Um, and I suffered that myself, and and I've got some stories I can share around, especially around the rope access side, where um, where I fell in that trap myself. The next piece around references is just a quick one around references. Um, I'll know an industry like this where where you do need a lot of different skill sets, but but good teams tend to travel around. So I used to work offshore and, and did all the Plutos and, and Gorgons and everything else offshore. And then I pivoted to renewables when I saw the light, of course. Um, but good working groups tend to travel together um, almost like a pack. And, and I don't want to say this in a negative way, but that is fantastic to build their own culture and to build their own ways of working and knowing what to expect from each other. Very similar to to a pack of forwards um, in, in rugby or a small team of special forces in the military where they have to be highly competent, highly experienced, and without asking, they, they tend to know what their team member is going to do or what they can do for them in terms of support. Um, so good references are important, but uh, as we know, um, any of us who go for roles, if they say, can, you, can we have some references, a lot of people will just choose someone who will give them a good reference. So just be aware of that um, because the industry can be quite, um, quite challenging in terms of trying to get people to sites. Um, the next one is the site access. That's typical. We've got site access. We need to get people to site now, uh, but be aware there's all these steps we have to go through before we get to site, in particular, some of um, the more mature clients. So I know James will talk about this later, but the maturity of a client in terms of their risk appetite is going to directly affect us as contractors and installing companies in terms of our risk profile. And that's, um, that's something to be aware of uh, in both the contracting space and actually doing the work. Um, this, this piece here around courses, I won't go into that too much, but a lot of us have awareness courses internally uh, and we have courses that cover certain items. But as, as we know, um, with our, with our um, manufacturers and operators and owners and tier one operators, they have their own specific equipment, which needs specific training and competence. So um, the GWO courses obviously breach, uh, breach across a lot of these areas, but um, internally recognized courses don't really work for us. and and, and they only give you sort of competence within one, one business. And that last one I just wanted to cover, um, and that's what I look for, and I know a lot of us look for this in our team members, is attitude. So um, attitude when you're out in the place where psychosocial risk is, is as high as it can be in terms of being away from home for some of those who haven't worked away before, um, being an industry that is um, fairly demanding 12-hour days um, of doing heavy, heavy work um, and then potentially having some challenges at home um, a lot of our people deal with that in a, in a different way. Um, having a good attitude in terms of our team members is critical. Uh, and for me, the one piece that cements all of that together um, is around our frontline leadership, which is which is key. Uh, and so therefore the attitudes are critical. So, okay, I'm gonna move on to our next slide. Um, this for me, again, is, is really important in terms of the context. So the context in which we operate affects how we operate in, in essence. Um, and therefore, challenges become opportunities if we if we deal with them in the right way. So um, 
we talked about the small teams already. Small teams are, for, for me, it's, it's fundamental that a small team that goes and does an activity knows each other, can work together um, and, is, uh, and is empowered. Um, but also that brings within itself a bit of a pivot in terms of assurance activities and oversight and insight into the work that they're doing. So as we all know, a small team will tend to go off and do what they want to do, especially if it's up in the nacelle, uh, the other activities. Uh, but therefore, it's also quite hard to make sure that we have our business assurance in place to maintain our standards and processes and procedures. So that, that, that attitude towards the propensity for risk taking is really key, again, in terms of pivoting back to doing the right thing when nobody's looking. And I know that's a very old saying, but that's the whole cultural piece I think is really critical. Um, this next, this next um, comment here around, around context, again, it's about risk. So there's a lot of contractors that are now pivoting from civil works, from uh, works around utilities and, and other industries, and they're pivoting into renewables because they can see the huge opportunities. Um, I remember back uh, in the day when RCR did something similar, um, and, and, uh, and obviously they went through a tough time themselves. The challenge here is if we don't have the latent understanding and the, the latent competency around the renewables in a, in a business and they pivot very quickly, uh, it can come with its own risks. And, and therefore, if you add the piece around the labor market, lower competency potentially in the, in the, in the teams, and then a client with a higher risk appetite, we, we're not going to uh, be in for a good ride in terms of that. Um, so it's really important to make sure that we don't just assume that we've done something like this or we've done bigger jobs. This one isn't very important. The risk is very much the same in terms of our people. Um, and that does get lost sometimes in, in terms of how we do our work. That next one there around profit margin, I, I know we don't want to talk about business systems and, and, and profit and loss and contracting right now, and, and that's not what I want to go into, but um, what I've seen across all of the industry where I've gone is um, the, the attitude in terms of a contractor and profit margin. The, the lower the margin is, the, the more challenging the work ends up being, uh, the harder it is to get really good equipment on site um, and have that investment that you need in terms of the work that we're going to be doing and we we shouldn't be talking about dollars over people uh, and time time over money but unfortunately that's that's what it comes down to in terms of um the success factors for us on on a project making sure that we have the right investment in the right areas and if the the level of investment is challenged because of where we are and the way that the, the, the contractual agreements have been set up we just have to make sure that we have that really good consistent baseline of managing risk about competent people with good attitudes who are doing um, the best job they can that's assured by the business with, with fit for purpose equipment. Um, and that's, I think that equipment piece is critical. Um, both James and I and a few others on the call can attest to uh, a lot of these construction sites um, that we've been talking about critical spares and what's available, what's not available. Um, having having a plan B if something breaks in terms of lifting gear or, or um, different setups in terms of our equipments and cranes and everything else so it's interesting how at the front end how things are set up for our construction projects how it can really affect us down the line um, down to the last person who has to do something with a, with a key piece of equipment um, that next one it's 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 about wind is um, I find that very interesting because it's, it's a very different approach to this topic uh, in different areas especially offshore but we're talking about onshore right now um, don't worry about the wind. It's, um, I always remember turning up at, at, at four or five in the morning, looking at the weather apps with the supervisors on the different sites and, um, and that's setting the tone for the rest of the day. Now, the challenge about, about this situation um, is that you've got all these different pressures being exerted from different areas. So you've got the, the project scope, you've got the schedule, the timelines, um, and then you've got the the teams on the site who want to do the work. I think we all, we all agree that people don't turn up on site to want to sit there and just wait because of the weather. Uh, nobody wants to do that, regardless of, of, of where, where they've come from in the background. They want to do the work. They enjoy seeing the progress. Um, it's a bit like, um, it's quite cathartic seeing the progress on a wind, wind farm where people are painting a wall and they can see the paint go on. It's very similar, putting up turbines uh, and moving on to the next one. I think people really enjoy that. Um, and that's the one thing I sort of, I really connect to in the industry is, is people seeing progress. But having wind delays really just squeezes that, squeezes that pressure from every, every direction, wind or weather, any type of weather. Um, and the way that we respond to that as a business is really important. So by passing on the pressure from, uh, from progress and schedule 
from the weather onto our own team members just really um, exacerbates that psychosocial st stress and risk that they're already under um, by being in the remote location. So, um, joint ventures, that's another one that we've, we've, we've learned from um, in the context. Now, I see the benefit, uh, definitely the benefit locally around cultural settings, around alignment, uh, having local joint ventures in working all these different locations because they they, they have the local knowledge and skills and expertise around where they are, the, the, the connections of the supply chain and uh, and um, and the community. Um, but also, we need to be mindful of those. In, in, in essence, that in itself needs needs a management of change, risk management, um, in terms of what their appetite is. And that pivots back to um, companies who are coming out of different industries and into the renewables, potentially because of, because of the opportunities, um, but might not understand the risk. Uh, which, is a, which is a big piece to look at. Um, <clears throat> this next point we've already mentioned is, is about the, the equipment. Um, all the good equipment is already on the big project. So for example, we're doing 100 turbines over here or 80 turbines over here, but only 20 or 15 over here. Um, <clears throat> the risk appetite for the contractor around the, the best cranes, the best equipment that we can get access to. Um, for me, it's always about fit for purpose. Um, we might not always have the best equipment, the brand new equipment, but in essence, if we if we bring in equipment onto our sites and working with our team members, at least it's our it's our obligation to have fit for purpose equipment, um, uh, and and the best equipment isn't always brand new equipment as we know. So that's a big piece around setting our people up for success. And that last piece there is around um, all the small items that we see. So when we're doing a hazard IDs or crawls or, or, or risk registers and all these type of things, we have small areas of potential process breakdown or incidents um, that are going to cause us delays and injuries and, and potentially affect the environment they're small in their in their isolation but when you look at um a wind farm construction out in the middle of nowhere uh, where there really isn't much uh, support and the teams have to be highly competent the equipment has to be the best it can and we have to have a good safety culture if you add all those things together the, the way i look at it is it accumulates in, in quite a decent risk profile so um and the way I always look at, at risk in general is I prioritize using PEAR. And a lot of you probably would have heard of PEAR before. Um, in, in, in my past roles, I looked after the crisis management portfolio for, for, for decent sized companies. And um, PEAR for me is always around the people, people first. And, and what do we do in terms of things going wrong and supporting our people? And it's not always physical. Um, that's something you all notice in the industry right now is the, is the real deep um, interest from the regulator, but also um, governing bodies around uh, psychosocial risk and mental health. That's a big piece. So for remote working in any location, this this is right at the top of the chain in terms of focus. I've had some dealings myself late, lately with the regulators in, in, in a few states in Australia around psychosocial risk and, and mitigations. Uh, and there's a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot to learn and share in that topic. And it's not all on paper. So it's key for me, the psychosocial risk piece. Uh, the next one's the environment. Of course, we've talked about this a lot before. Um, <clears throat> surprisingly, the the effect of, on the environment from doing this work is 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 fairly. So we try and mitigate that with with sustainable supply chains, um, and then and then recycling some of the waste equipment from from some of these projects. But it does generate quite a bit of waste. So in terms of risk uh, and an opportunity around around the local community, environment is key. Um, the next one is assets uh, in terms of our equipment, both in our supply chain and directly what we're using in, in terms of risk. So um, it, it is a concern that one piece of fairly small equipment on a, on a site, on a wind farm project, i.e. turning tools and things like that, um, being damaged or um, not operating correctly could, re could affect the whole project and could affect the whole team and, and the schedule for sites. So that's why we go back to talking about critical spares. Um, and, and for me, those risks, the, the equipment, the asset risk or the equipment risk really then boils down into the people risk uh, in terms of stress and um, psychosocial risk because everything just accumulates. So for example, um, if you have an equipment issue that then delays, which then is um, compounded by weather delays and then finally you get the equipment just imagine what that small team uh what pressure is going to be on them in terms of um having to go and win the world cup on their own it's it's really important that to, to focus on these things and identify them okay let me just move on to the next slide Okay, so this is a topic we've um, 
we've mentioned earlier in our in our slide pack. For me, this is um, probably one of the most pivotal areas uh, a business, a team, uh, and and our operating um, tier one operators can invest in frontline leadership. With where I am right now, it's it's a huge focus. Um, and in my last two businesses before that, we we really heavily invested in in frontline leadership. And and I and I, and I believe that's that's. Uh, it's not a new, it's not a new fad, of course, uh, but I believe that's really the best bang for your buck uh, in terms of change and consistency, um, and that's because I've seen it. You know, I've been I've been on the ground working as an as an operator, both in the military and <clears throat> offshore on the tools, and I, I can really understand how the frontline leadership just create that pivot point about setting the scene for how and 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 why you're doing your work, and then also also in the corporate environment, the same thing. So. It's a big piece for me, but it, it does come with it does come with its baggage in a sense in in terms of appointing and su and supporting and empowering our leadership on on the ground, um, and the first one is is very much one of the most common ones, and a lot of us talk about this uh, in, in terms of working with our with our operational leadership is <clears throat> they've been in the role for five years, so they're fine. We need a supervisor, put them in um, two years or one year or ten years, depending on your context. Now that that in some cases um, can work, but if you think about the skill set required, and I've got this later on, the skill set required to manage tasks uh, and progress well with 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 tasks and 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 your uh, work at hand in terms of tools and inanimate objects and working with teams, um, those those skill sets are very very different to the skill sets required to lead teams and to understand how to get the best out of people and to have that emotional intelligence to identify risk in a person. So I know it'll be covered later, but for me that preconceived bias around this person has been there for a few years, they can now be a supervisor or a leader or all of a sudden more accountable. That's that's probably for me um, the key there is be more accountable. So, uh, that that, that preexisting bias um, is a challenge in industry. And what I like is that we're all pivoting and capitalizing on what we've learned in, in mining and oil and gas and other industries um, and then coming into renewables and using those skill sets. So, what I would say is there's a mix probably in the in the in the labor market of um, some fresh people, some green people, uh, but also a lot of people with with some really good experience, which is fantastic. Um, so as I mentioned there, that the skills for for, um, for for finishing tasks or doing tasks well um, are very different to the skills of of getting the best out of people. So um, that'll be covered later. Um, that next one is is um, probably a, a key in terms of what pressures people are under. So time. Time, um, time taken versus risk, in a sense. And, and we always talk about <clears throat> the traffic light situation with the amber light and do I go, do I stay, am I late for a meeting, all those type of things. But on, a, on, the, on the front front line of a construction site, when the weather is coming in uh, and we've only got the crane for two more days and this team are all going on leave tomorrow, it all just compounds. And then that, that go, no go sometimes is on a front line leader. Um, and imagine that, that weight of, of of expectation um at jonah loma running for the trial line sorry about the rugby references I'm, i will stop okay there's a few uh and you you then decide um either you go or no go and, and what does that mean in terms of mental health and stress on our people and, and don't forget when someone suffers in a sense of psychosocial risk even 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 in a small way in terms of how they feel or how they behave and it's and and that injury so we call it an injury these days now a psychosocial injury um which bullying harassment any type of stress and that's where the regulator's going when someone suffers a psychosocial injury regardless how um how minute it tends to affect everyone maybe not the same day or the next day but it does and and that really um affects the team as we know so it's really important to just keep an eye on that in, in terms of uh, the supervisor is just a supervisor. They're not. Um, the next one uh, is about clients and rates and everything else. It is, it is one that I've seen a lot uh, where, where contractors, in essence, are, are trying to make sure that people fill certain roles that do, that do, have, that do attract um, higher, higher rewards. Um, and that then forces people into roles that they're not ready for. But that's, that's something I think is just, just worth keeping in mind in terms of if you're planning and getting ready to deliver a big project. These are things that are more, more sort of lessons learned from, from what I've seen uh, over the last few years. This next one, again, I won't go too much into technical leadership, but managing your mates. Um, yeah, really, really tough, especially the first time you do it. So fr from my perspective, um, <clears throat> moving from 
insight roles to oversight roles is, is a real difficult time. Um, and uh, personally and professionally, it's a difficult time where you, you, you're trying hard in a lot of different areas. So I think it's important to, to empower and, and support frontline leadership if they are making that transition um, because it's not, it's not an easy one. Um, and that for me is the same as <clears throat> having, having vacant roles and sending parachuting in five or six people uh, and saying to the supervisor, great, we've got your team full. Don't worry about it. You're, you're not down anyone. But, but bear in mind, if those five or six people are new to industry, have just got their qualifications or they haven't been uh, in remote working before, <clears throat> that supervisor is not set up for success. Um, if anything, they've got to work harder to to, to do the buddy system, to make sure that they're um, inducted properly and they're aware of. It's it's definitely, and, and James, please mention this later, it's definitely not a case of getting on site and jumping on a tagline um, when when new people to industry or to or, or to offshore um, remote working get to site, because um, that, you know, that that does happen. Um, but it's that's, that's definitely not what we want as an outcome um, in terms of reducing our risk. We talked about um, training before in terms of its transactional nature. Um, training and experience, <clears throat> two different things. Uh, and then the last piece for me um, is, is, is pivoting back to what I said at the beginning. It's really, it's really for me the, the key, the key role on our on our sites. Everyone is just as important in terms of the roles that we play and, and working as a team. But um, only one person has that last line of communication, that last influence, that last touch point to to the workforce in terms of managing risk and their appetite for risk. And, and that's not the CEO, the MD, the project director, that is that is the frontline supervisor. So um, there's there's a bit of a message, message around leadership. Um, and in terms of um, the people piece, <clears throat> lastly, uh, short service employees, I think a lot of us have talked about this in the past and we'd see it on uh, project management plans and we'd see it in, in sometimes in in risk registers from 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 clients and let's see short service employees when you look at the definition go <clears throat> someone who's been with us uh less than six months and you look at that now in terms of the attrition rate retention rate in our industry and on some of our construction projects <clears throat> and that six month timeline um you might as well call it a year two years three years because these projects the the general size of them at the moment do not last that long. Uh, maybe they do last a year, maybe they last eight months or 10 months, but a short service employee for us is definitely not someone who goes up to the six month mark. Excuse me. <clears throat> we do have contractors that move around all the time. And, and for me, that's a, that's a really good positive in terms of people who come to site for a short period of time because they have to fill a role or because there's a technical need or a specialist need, <clears throat> but they bring with them a phenomenal amount of um, different experience and, and cultures that they've seen in different areas. So for me, it's important to, to capitalize on people that come in for short periods of time <clears throat> because they do have a lot of different experience and knowledge and, and they might bring some standards with them from different clients and different projects that are going to support us and, and, and make us better in terms of what we do rather than um, create a risk because then they're, they're very, very new. So you have to really assess uh, and, and do some do some um, do some investigation in terms of bringing people to site short term because a lot of this could be a, a real good benefit to to the rest of the team um, and they have to be empowered of course so in terms of pre-existing bias around this and I've suffered it myself having been a contractor for for many years uh, and, and in the consultancy piece is that short service employees or contractors and consultants have got different motivations <clears throat> the, the, the pre-existing bias around they only worry about themselves or their own careers or their own business um, and they'll be here one day gone the next that really isn't um isn't a fair reflection of the skills that they can bring uh, and also their knowledge <clears throat> and expertise so it's important to align the motivators and, and and the goals um the next one is about rates i'm sure lots of people talk about this uh, in the industry like they used to when <clears throat> when we've had a few booms in oil and gas here around rates uh, at the end of the day, we're all on site, we're all doing our roles, we're all supporting uh, each other and keeping each other safe. Um, those pre-existing bias, I think, are starting to get a bit, are getting a bit uh, more mute now because um, as, as more work happens in the renewable industry, especially onshore in wind, uh, things start to flatten out and become more, more equal um, so that there's not a huge disparity, especially in, even in the contracting community, the consulting community. We've talked about the experience uh, in terms of that uh, 
comment with contractors and consultants. What I will say is um, <clears throat> it's harder for them to then come in and do the storming, norming, forming piece because they're, <clears throat> because they're so used to uh, moving around, but it does happen. A lot of people build skill sets to create uh, create um, connections very quickly. So I know James and I have talked about this in terms of um, that cycle sometimes is very quick with certain people, uh, which is important. So we talked about the connections on the next piece there um, <clears throat> and the team player piece I think is critical. So certain people who move around teams a lot uh, might not, you might not get the, the feeling from them that they are a team player and they're vested in the success of the team. They're only vested in the success of themselves. But again, just got to be mindful of that. I don't think it's a fair reflection of everybody. There might be those people out there in, in terms of um, there for the week or the two weeks and then moving on, but it's, it's our roles uh, in, in all of our levels on, on these projects um, and the industry to, to envelop those people, include them and make them feel part of the team. So <clears throat> the teamwork is always a two way street. It's, it's about what the individuals do and what the team does. So, uh, and again, that pivots back to what tone the leadership set both um, on, on the ground and at the top level of the business. Um, so like I said, there on the last piece there, the variety of experiences <clears throat> uh, will improve and, and um, cement the site team culture rather than um, water it down. Okay, so the last two slides I'll just go through um, fairly quickly because, <clears throat> excuse me, they're um, they are just setting setting through some some discussion points about about some frameworks and um, some some content around taking away uh, from from this presentation. Um, I know that that um, the, the technical pieces will be covered later, so I just wanted to quickly go through. Um, a couple of points on the last two slides, but they'll be very quick. So then I don't really want to discuss them in, in depth um, and I'm happy to later in the, in the, in the meeting rooms. Okay. Excuse my coughing. It's just the, the air con dries my throat. It's nothing else. I promise. Okay. <clears throat> uh, just in terms of assumptions, like I've said before, we try not to assume anything when we get to these sites, um, making sure we set the tone in terms of our behaviors. Uh, in terms of our, our, our cultures on sites uh, and make sure that we follow up. So for me, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, <clears throat> for me, the, the follow-up piece is probably the most critical in terms of what we've learned. Um, lessons learned follow, aren't really embedded in the company if you have a massive a transient workforce. So it's really important to front load the learnings straight into our projects um, and, and follow up, especially if they're from external sources. So we haven't had to have the breakdowns to learn. Um, okay, I think that's that's my time. Well, thank you so much, Pierre. That was so informative. We have had some um, questions pop up in our discussion area. Do you think that there's um, an air of, if we're talking competency of workers and we're talking potentially young workers or even experienced trade people that <laughs> have worked in non-related industries, do you think there's an air of embarrassment potentially that they don't want to highlight a lagging level of competency and the time that it takes them to get across this new infrastructure sector? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I don't, I don't want to point out <clears throat> any particular gender in this, but I know for me, uh, when I went out of the military and, and into into um, rope access and, and oil and gas, which is a lot of the rope access guys do that, I was very proud that I managed to land a role out on this project. You know, I was very proud that I've, I've, I've been given this role. And for someone to go, well, you've only been here five minutes. You've never seen, uh, never seen a turbine. This, this, was, the, this was the typical one <clears throat> on some of our projects uh, for people who turned up on site. Have you ever seen a turbine? And it was always, always the first question. And it's really not fair on people because the, the whole point of, of capitalizing on other industries and other skill sets is, is to share and learn. Um, and if you haven't seen a turbine, understand he, he, what are your skill sets that you've already got and let's apply them to the work that we have here um, and that's really up to the business in terms of its appetite for risk to um, alienate those people or capitalize on the skills that they have but yes I, I definitely agree and um, and I don't know if that's going to be going away that all depends on the culture that you set on site um, you know what does that say to you about the culture on site if the first question from anyone when you arrive there and you do an induction by the way have you seen a turbine uh, by the way, do you know the names of all the components? I mean, it's, yeah, that's, it's sad, but it happens, yes. 
it's a culture that sets the tone to allow these conversations to happen openly in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. So I definitely think it happens and it's up to us, um, <clears throat> especially as, as leadership and frontline leadership to, to, um, to try and avoid that. I 100% agree. Oh, thank you so much.